Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Bratelius, and I work for ABG, Sundal Collier. And uh, I would like to kick off this day by presenting Henrik Stenlund, CFO of uh, Vostok Emerging Finance. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Uh, and I hope everyone can hear me OK. So we have 20 minutes. I'm going to jump right into it. Um, so we're Vostok Emerging Finance, uh, a fintech investment company operating in the crossroads of uh, financial services and emerging markets. Uh, and this is a snapshot of the company now. Our latest reported NEV was $223 million. Uh, we have uh, some cash, uh, a war chest to invest of $20 million. Uh, we have made 14 investments since inception and two exits with um, quite good results, actually, with uh, an average 65% IRR on those two. Those were a Russian uh, um, digital bank, Tinkoff Bank, and a Turkish payments company, Iziko. Um, so how do we invest and, and where? Uh, so we're focused on emerging markets, but sector-wise, uh, we target basically all uh, sectors of financial services, be it credit, payments, uh, wealth management, and what have you. Uh, geography, we like scale markets, hence we have exposure in Brazil, which I will come back to, uh, Mexico, Pakistan, Russia, scale markets with a big population. This is very important to us. Uh, we typically take uh, minority stakes of 10 to 20 percent, uh, roughly, and our sweet spot is probably the growth stage, early growth stage when it comes to, to investment. Um, we think we're a unique fintech investment vehicle. We're listed on Nasdaq First North, so we provide some liquidity for our shareholders while investing in the private space, which is a uh, space that is very hard to get access to for, for many investors. So it's a great vehicle. Um, and this is uh, representing, we're basically touching anything that is related to, uh, to fintech or financial services, as you can see from this slide. Um, the only thing in this slide we haven't really tapped into is in short tech, but that is probably something to, uh, to be investigated further. Well, we are in credit payments. PFMs, um, investments, and embedded fintech, if you wish, uh, with accounting SaaS, for example. We have a global lens because we invest globally, and this is a great asset for us. So we, uh, we see the, the types of business models that work in one market, and we can take learnings and experience from that market and apply in the new market uh, with the same models, basically. And uh, partners are very, very important to us. We invest far away from home. Uh, and we have partnered up with some of the, uh, the strongest local VC companies in each market that we operate. Uh, and this is something we're putting a lot of effort into, nurturing that network. Uh, and that's how we get some of the deal flow as well. Uh, with strong partners, uh, they will come to us because we fill a perfect capital gap uh, in the early stage growth uh, phase of the companies. We have a, a global mandate, as I mentioned, and a well-diversified portfolio. And as you can see from this slide, 60% um, of our NAV is in Brazil. 75% uh, of the NAV uh, is in LATAM, and that is by design. Now, we'll come back to Brazil as well and why we think that is maybe the holy grail of fintech markets today. Um, but we also have exposure, as I mentioned, in, in Russia, in India, in Africa, uh, in emerging Europe as well. So well-diversified portfolio. Um, this is another representation of the portfolio. And as you can see from the pie chart here, um, Creditas is, is emerging as the relative size portfolio company uh, for us. And, and this is probably the company uh, that is going to move the needle uh, from an NAV perspective in the short run. That's what we think, and that's our belief. And the two largest there, uh, Creditas and Confio, those are uh, the emerging winners, we would like to think. Uh, even it's, it's still early stage, but uh, we have high hopes for those companies. Um, and as you can see here, we have a very well diversified portfolio, but six, per six out of 12 holdings are based in Brazil, and we touch basically uh, any financial uh, services play uh, in terms of fintech and sector here. So Brazil, why? do we have 60% of our NAV in Brazil? It is a bit of a concentration, but as I said, it's by design. We think Brazil is by far today the most interesting fintech uh, market globally. 
Um, it's a scale market. It's over 200 million population, uh, which is uh, very important for us. That means you don't have to go beyond the borders of the, of the country because the market is big enough uh, and you can make it while well, staying at your home turf. That decreases risk for us. Um, Brazil is also one of the most online markets uh, globally. People are uh, using uh, internet, they are using uh, social media. Um, I think it's the fourth uh, largest social media country globally. And they are very well acquainted with, with internet and the online services that's going on. Um, it's also an oligopolistic banking sector where a handful of the, the top banks control basically 80% of the uh, loans in the system. Um, and that is in a country where some of the highest interest rates and fees, which means it's a huge market to tap into for any fintech. Um, it's a well-banked ecosystem, actually. So it's an emerging market, but we develop market features many times. And when it comes to banking, it's just the banking experience uh, that is bad for many of the customers and the pricing. So in Brazil, it's, it's not so much a case of educating the masses uh, and tell them this is financial services, you need this. It's more a case of giving them something that's better, cheaper, better user experience, um, and more efficient, basically. Um, some of the companies that we invest in, they operate under uh, various licenses. Uh, so the, the, the licensing or, or the regulatory framework becomes very, very important for us as well. And, and Brazil is a country where the regulations have been favoring uh, fintech, uh, emerging fintech players, um, which is it's also very important for us. Um, great assets in this country in terms of people and ecosystem. Um, super strong uh, entrepreneurs, uh, very, very competent and great visa community uh, that's within our network. Um, also a given uh, important thing when you invest. Um, it's easy to, uh, to spend money for everyone. Uh, it's a different question to get the money back and hopefully with a great return. Uh, and Brazil is also market with uh, a proven history of, of uh, great value creation and, and uh, very viable exit market, uh, which is something we clearly like and, and investors think is important. That's, that's what we do. So jumping into to Creditas. So Creditas is a digital secured lending platform in Brazil. In Brazil, roughly 70% of all the houses and the cars are owned debt free. At the same time, Brazilians are paying some of the highest interest rates in the world. And you can see from this slide that the top three highest priced categories on, credit, on the credit side, credit cards, overdraft, and, and personal loans, they're priced at an APR of 230%, uh, which is very, very high, uh, to say the least. And this uh, itself re represents a revenue pool of $125 billion. So it's a very, very big uh, market for credit us to tap into. So Credit Us offers uh, consumers um, the option to, to use their cars or their homes as collateral to reduce the high uh, lending costs that they are paying on, on these uh, um, categories uh, on the credit side. Um, it's a huge market, uh, and uh, Credit Us is growing um, very, very fast. All the companies in our, uh, um, in our portfolio are growing super fast, and Credit Us is, is one of the fastest growing ones and represents 30% of our NIV today. Nibo, we're staying in Brazil. So uh, Nibo is an accounting SaaS uh, company. I think the, the best peers would be probably Fort Knox uh, or Zero out of New Zealand. Um, so it's a, the leading um, accounting SaaS platform for small businesses in, in Brazil with a client base today of uh, approximately 300,000 uh, small businesses um, that are, and also 3,000 accountants. And, and um, small businesses in, in uh, Brazil are legally bound to use an accountant. Uh, so Nibo have been distributing their uh, products uh, on their platform through the accountant base to reach the end consumer. Um, Nibo keeps adding new features and products to the uh, offering uh, every day. Um, Today, it's, it's the classic accounting SaaS products like accounts uh, reconciliation, um, cash flow uh, projection tools, but you have also payment options and issuing of invoices, etc. But I think the, 
the most interesting thing with, with Nebo, except for being a great company in a fantastic and unloved space, because accounting SaaS isn't the most loved space, uh, which is why we like it. So the competition is, is lower. Um, but it's the data set, the extreme data amount that Nebo is accumulating through this uh, SMB base. Uh, and that is, of course, something that down the line will and are going to be uh, monetized. Um, so that's Nebo, our Fort Knox, let's call it that. Um, and as always, we invest in entrepreneurs, uh, strong entrepreneurs uh, and, and a great founding team, which is, which is key for us to pull the trigger when it comes to investments. The last company, because I can't run through uh, all 12 of them, uh, is, is Confio. Uh, it's also a lending platform, but this is in Mexico. Uh, and this is an unsecured lending platform. Um, and Confio started um, basically only extending loans um, uh, to their uh, client base. And, and this is a very big untapped market as well. They're attacking roughly 7 million SMEs uh, in the country to offer. And that's the high end category of, of that segment in the pyramid, as you can see there. Um, so uh, how, how do they do it? Uh, Unsecured lending is its risky business, but but credit uh, sorry uh, Confio, uh, they're leveraging big data, uh, their own tech stack, uh, coupled with uh, fiscal policies um, like um, uh, mandatory electronic invoicing, which means they are extracting a lot of data, so they are able to score these SMEs uh, and give a very very clear picture of uh, their credit worthiness before they are extending the loans. Um, Confio have larger ambitions than only extending credit and being a, a lending platform. Uh, I think we will see this company uh, becoming everything SME for Mexico, um, be it payments, uh, ERP uh, on the accounting side, uh, coupled with the financial services pool. And they're already today um, offering actually their tech stack, uh, like banking as a solution to some of the largest uh, um, uh, clients in, in, in the market, like uh, Grupo Modelo, for example, the beverages company that you may have heard of. Uh, so they are actually using the tech stack from Confio to score their own supply chain uh, and, and extend credit to them. So their part or their, their share of, of uh, non-credit related revenues are, are becoming substantial, actually, even from a low base. But um, we can see a great future for, for this company, um, as well as the other companies in the portfolio. I'm not saying I love this company the most, because you don't, just don't say that, but it's a great company. Uh, super strong founding team and entrepreneurs as well, uh, and, and we have great confidence in, in that this is going to be uh, one of, one of the, the two companies, I think, in, in, um, in the medium term that's going to have a, a real impact for us. So that's the portfolio, um, snapshot of the portfolio. Mm, and this is our history. Um, this slide shows uh, our NAV development since uh, inception, basically. Um, and um, the share price have more or less tracked the NAV with a varying degree of discount, which is something we obviously don't like. Uh, but of late, I think many, uh, many new investors have, have uh, sort of gotten around our story, and, and we have been tracking uh, a, a much lower discount uh, to the NAV uh, of late. And again, repeating the numbers, uh, latest report in the Q2, $223 million uh, of NAV. Um, the share price at that point was 315, um, and market cap 210 million. Um, coming back to, uh, to uh, the fundamental thing that we, we do, we invest to be able to exit at higher valuations. And um, the two exits we have made so far is, as I mentioned, Tink of Bank, where we had a 65% IRR and 6.1 and, and uh, cash and cash uh, multiple on that, which is great. Um, Tink of was a listed asset um, in our portfolio. Um, and um, we invest in, and play in the private space, not the... Um, not the listed. The other uh, exit we did was in a Turkish payment company, and this was a great school book example of how we want to invest. Um, very early stage, with uh, actually when the tanks were on the street and then the, the coup happened. <laughs> uh, so that meant uh, a favorable pricing point for us and, and uh, less competition. 
Uh, this was a fantastic company that got acquired by Naspers, um, uh, which is uh, the PayU, uh, which is the arm, um, payments arm from Naspers. Uh, and we, we uh, had a great uh, return on that asset as well. We would have loved to, to keep holding it, but we, in our investment thesis and, and strategy, when the entrepreneurs are ready to move, we follow suite as well. Um, and looking at the unrealized returns, um, I'm, I'm more in favor of looking at the actual returns, but, but um, as you can see from here, we have had on, on, on a per share basis NAV close to 24% since inception, um, and the share price is tracking that, so a little bit lower at 22. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have prepared some questions. Uh, I saw the impressive um, track record, but do you have any financial targets connected to this on IRR or uh, multiple? Uh, yeah, we do. We, um, we always try to, uh, you know, the, the, the spreadsheets and the models on paper say something, and then reality is always different. Uh, it could be better or worse, but, but we try to target uh, a 30% IRR when we uh, take the investment uh, decisions. Yeah, and uh, how long is normally your investment horizons? Uh? Good question. Um, so we are long-term investors. Look, early stage uh, emerging market fintech, that, that's a bag of risk, uh, to be quite honest. But, but it's a huge upside as well. But that means that we are very long-term when it comes to investing. So typically, uh, we, we have a horizon of five to seven years in that range. But you can end up holding a, an asset that is great and, and are generating cash flows for you uh, longer than that. Uh, and it can be shorter, as in the case with uh, Isico, for example. Um, we were in no rush to sell that company, but an opportunity presented itself. And that tends to happen with, uh, with the greatest assets. <laughs> yeah. You get offers and you say no, but <laughs> at, at some point in time, the entrepreneurs think this is... This is good for us, and we should take it. And then, then we are supportive as um, as investors. And we didn't mention that, but we have board seats in in all our holdings, so we are very active as investors as well. Yeah, uh, and uh, now we are in a COVID nineteen uh, yeah. world. Uh, so, what is happening on the activity? How is mm. the deal being sourced now? Is activity going down? How mm. is uh, valuations impacted in the sector? And how do you think this will progress going forward? Also a great question. I think, look, we, um, in Q1, uh, we wrote down the portfolio with 25% roughly. Um, and that was uh, because of no visibility from, from the COVID uh, pandemic happening around the world. Um, what we did was that we, we worked extremely actively with uh, every single portfolio companies. Uh, we um, altered their business plans. Um, with them, of course, um, just to do anything to, to extend the cash runway uh, throughout this window because of the low visibility. Um, in Q1, um, portfolio value uh, went up again, um, and, and simply because I think all of the companies are back at the same level they were back in March. And we also had a window when we saw that uh, the pandemic was hitting Europe uh, it was a bit later in, in these markets, uh, like Brazil and, um, and, and Mexico, for example. So, so we could actually see what was going on uh, and, and prepare accordingly. Uh, but all the, the companies are back on a growth footing and looking at maybe two other names in the portfolio um, in the payment space, like TransferGo, which is a remittances company. Uh, they're tracking ahead of budget. They haven't been impacted at all uh, by the pandemic. Um, and an Indian payments company, which is our re most recent investment. Same thing there, just adding partners. And they are, they are in a sense, beneficiaries from, from, from the pandemic uh, in terms of you know, uh, accelerated digitalization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, deal sourcing, uh, we have, um, for obvious reasons, been very inward focused during this window. Uh, but we are constantly building a pipeline of companies, but we, we haven't really pulled the trigger on anything new at this stage. Um, but we see, I think, the seed type of tickets, the super, super early ones, um, they are unimpacted because it's <laughs> like, we need $1 million and this is the valuation you can get uh, uh, for that. Uh, so that's not really impacted. Um, but obviously, 
Maybe the mid-range uh, have been a bit, you know, um, demand has come down slightly, but that's on the way up again. We see a, a great, uh, great uh, pipeline now coming through. So, uh, and also I think worth mentioning, you know, headlines versus reality uh, in, in some of these markets. There's, um, to our experience, a, a very big disc discrepancy uh, between there. Uh, headlines are screaming the world is going under, but in reality, things aren't that bad uh, necessarily so yeah yeah i you you're very tilted to brazil and yeah, they uh, we are. they have uh, according to the headlines they have a huge problem with the covid-19 yeah. as of now but mm. uh, how has and they do yeah, I mean, yeah obviously of course but how has this Im uh, impacted uh, creditas and what is the next step for for that company uh, in the future can mm. it uh, is it expanding outside the latin america or uh, outside the brazil region mm. or what's your thoughts yeah no great question uh, as well look creditas uh, what they did in this pandemic window, uh, they stopped customer acquisition spending um, and they turned to cash flow positive in, in uh, a matter of a couple of weeks, uh, which is something that's easily said or shown on paper, but, but you never really trust it until you've seen it uh, for real. But they did, which was a fantastic stress test uh, through the window uh, for, for Creditas. Um, Creditas have actually set up shop in Mexico uh, recently, so they, uh, they are starting uh, slowly. Um, we, think, we think Brazil is a big enough market um, for us, um, actually, but, but they are doing that. Uh, but what they're doing, they're building new offerings and, and uh, deepening the customer experience and, and uh, the customer engagement through the, the core pillars that they have, which is car, auto, and payroll. Secured products uh, with a variety of different services and, and products uh, coupled with that. So um, super interesting future for creditors. And maybe because I always get that question, um, so when are they going to exit? Uh, we don't know, to be, to be quite frank. But I think Creditors is, is maybe the company that is closest to, to some sort of, of exit, uh, if you think from a like, two to three year perspective or something like that. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I wish I had more time to ask more questions, but I will uh, uh, ask a final one. So how hands-on are you as in... Uh, uh, as an owner, uh, how do you work uh, with your yeah, companies? No, yeah, no, we're we're very active as owners. So, so uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, we have board representation in in uh, all our holdings. Uh, we have, uh, and specifically during this window, uh, we have been on on weekly calls, uh, uh, and we get weekly and monthly KPIs from from all the companies constantly. So we're interacting, speaking, engaging continuously. Um, so very, very active is the short answer to that <laughs> question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Thank you, Henrik. And uh, we unfortunately have to move on with others. Uh, thank you for today. Thank you for having me.